Yeah, hello. Good morning. Um, before the jibes come in about the technology, I am going to use an overhead projector. I have been known, I have been known to use PowerPoint, but um, I want to do this because, um, well, you'll see very quickly why, I want to be able to flip and change. Um, for those of you who haven't been here before, let me just explain. Originally, this seminar was set up because the distance learning students studied for two years or three years, whatever it was, without talking to anybody. And they wanted to see who we were. So we had arranged seminars here. And the idea originally was nothing more than to give you the chance to talk. I'm the fool guy. My job is to create an atmosphere where you talk to each other. So you see the title, Information Security, what's it all about? And you might be tempted to think that that's what I'm going to attempt to answer. It's not. You're going to answer. I'm just going to listen and um, maybe throw in the odd comment if and when it's appropriate. You should also be aware that there are an awful lot of, let's say, graduates or ex-professors or whatever in the room. Dieter Goldman at the back there helped us set up the master's program and then left us to go to bigger things, greater things, then left the greater things and came back to academia. Uh, <laughs> there are a number of people here with the degree and so on. So it will be easy to get the conversation going. What we've got to remember is there are students here. How many of you have not even started the degree yet? So he said, we've got to make sure that you just don't get swamped. So you've got to cry out. If people use words you don't know the meaning of, ask them and I will make sure they answer. This will shut them up from making them dominate. <laughs> so what is it all about? Well, I'm not going to tell you. I'm hoping you're going to tell me. But this is sort of, sort of a working definition or working methodology, whatever you to say, that the Royal Holloway people use. The features of confidentiality, which is protecting information from unauthorised disclosure. Integrity, which is protecting information from unauthorised modification. And then availability, which is ensuring information is available to authorised users. And I think it's clear, yes, the unauthorised, unauthorised, authorised is the common theme. So it's not surprising to find that authentication is arguably the central theme of all, um, all security. It's easy to have confidential conversations with people you talk to the wrong person. It's very easy to let the wrong people change things. And the Data Protection Act and so on is there to try to make sure that only authorised people can do the right things. So I'm not going to go on to that too much. I do want to go to the next slide, and if I don't get any further than this transparency, I'll be delighted. What is it all about? Well, up there, there are three topics, and the, the sages in the room will be looking and saying, that's not enough, there should be more. But let's go through them first. Technology. There's hardware, algorithms, protocols. Technology is clearly important. And then for management infrastructure, you need your key management to look after the cryptographic keys. Security architectures, so that's the framework, the design, and so on. BS 77999, I deliberately haven't changed that. That was a code of practice um, that's turned into a standard, which you might call it a standard of management or a standard of good behavior, or, but it's really a code of practice. And then there's business, and we mustn't forget business. I mean, no business exists to be secure. It'd be interesting to do in a minute to ask you why you're in the room, why you're studying information security, and I'll come on to that in a little while. But at the back of everything else is that securities have to meet their business requirements. Now, I deliberately haven't changed this slide since last year. I haven't changed this slide for, I think, seven years, whenever we did the first one. But a lot of things have happened since, and there are lots of different emphases. And it is conceivable that the wise men in the room were saying, well, he hasn't got a human factors there. And there's no doubt human factors are coming up the agenda. They're certainly there. It's certainly true, for instance. Now, let me just get, how many of you live outside the UK? OK, so if I, if I quote some things that happened in the UK that you're not aware of, remind me. But recently in the UK, for instance, there was the tax office lost, or we believe they lost, two disks with the records of 25 million 
um, people on them, personal records of 25 million people. And that was undoubtedly due to human error or deliberate human fraud. I mean, we we're not quite sure which. You can't blame the technology. It is true that without the technology, no one could have sold 25 million records. Ten years ago, to steal those same records, you'd need umpteen forklift trucks, and you'd take away a lot of papers, it'd be difficult. So the technology enabled the information to be on one or two disks, but the loss of the disks was not the fault of the technology. It was the fault either of not having the processes in place or of people not following the processes. So that could be all hidden in here, or you could argue I should have changed the slide and put up human factors and had a whole section, and maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't, I don't care. I mean, there is no doubt, however, that the profile of information security is changing. There's no doubt it's increasing dramatically almost day by day. Just last year, last, last week, um, the Dutch government had to abandon all of their plans for e-government because the um, certification authority they were using turned out to be untrustworthy for some reason. We don't quite sure why, but it's a changing world. The, let's take about encryption because I, I know encryption quite well. And there is no question at all that the use of encryption for confidentiality has always bothered governments. That's a statement I'm happy to defend and I don't think any government would think. And if you look at government's policy on encryption, then crudely speaking, they want or are happy for the good guys, and good has to be in inverted commas because it's their definition of good, to be using encryption for everything that's good. They just don't want it used for bad purposes. And the problem with that concept is that the idea of good and bad is one thing subjective and also changes. Alliances between countries change over decades and so on. So here's a system. Two communicators, sender and receiver, interceptor. And you use encryption because you don't want the interceptor to um, know what you're doing. So there are three players there, and the sender and receiver want to exchange confidential information. They don't want the interceptor to know what they're doing. So who in that triangle are the good guys? Is it the sender and the receiver, or is it the interceptor? And of course, it's a stupid question, because it depends who they are and what it's being used for. And so you cannot say, I mean, in the, if you look at the early books written in the 1980s, there was a whole host of books written on cryptography, and all the authors said in those books, though none of them believed it, because they all knew the truth, that the good guys were the sender and the receiver, typically the banks, and the bad guy was going to be the bank robber trying to um, take your money out of your bank. And so the concept of a burglar being a man with a mask and a swag bag was changing to be a hacker, or a computer freak, or whatever you want to call them. And then in 1991, on this famous occasion, the American government came along and said, you got it all wrong. We're the good guys. If you can't trust your government, who can you trust? That famous statement that had us all rolling in the aisles. And we sit here. And we have to sit here to protect our country from terrorists, pedophiles, law enforcement, good of the nation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And within, and, and this was known for everybody, the, the Echelon network has been well known for years. <coughs> within two or three months, the UK government said, well, of course, we intercept. It's part of daily life. Doesn't everybody do it? And, and there is this concept of lawful interception. But it doesn't help you to find who the good guys and the bad guys are. Here's law enforcement's dilemma. I genuinely believe they don't want to intrude in other people's private lives. Now, there are certain civil liberties organizations who may disagree with that, and I'm, that's my personal belief. They certainly don't want to hinder e-commerce, not for UK e-commerce. They do want to have their own secure communications, no question. They need to. 
they occasionally use interceptions to obtain information. And be aware there is a concept of lawful interception. Lawful interception is a recognized concept. It's not subversive. They legally intercept. And they occasionally need to reconfiscate decrypted information. Famous occasions of current pedophile files where they've got loads of disks. They, they firmly believe they've got pedophile information on it, but they can't break it. So now look at three and five. Go back to this slide here. One of them implies that sometimes law enforcement wants to be on the horizontal line. And sometimes law enforcement wants to be on the vertical line. When you're on the horizontal line, you want your encryption to be unbreakable. When you're on the vertical line, you want to break the encryption being used. Brilliant though cryptographers may be, they can't invent an algorithm that's strong when the good guys use it and bad, weak when the bad guys use it. So there's a dilemma here. You can't win on the vertical line and on the horizontal line. You can try it, but you clearly can't. So the dilemma is, what do you do about encryption? Now, I'm not going to answer it, but there's the type of thing you have... And the, the dilemma comes really because it's not clear who the good guys are and who the bad guys are in every situation. It is clear that many different countries, many different organizations are all using the same technology. And so the good guys and the bad guys share technology. They share technology, but they have different motives, different inventives. What the answer is, I don't know. Colin is about to come and wrap me on the knuckles. So I think I'll stop. Um, you disappointed me. I got to four slides instead of two, which means you failed, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but I guess I jumped it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.